So before we get started, quick show of hands. Who here has already used Apple 9? No? Huh? One? What about Apple 8? Who's used that? A few of y'all, yeah. What about Apple 7? Okay, yeah. So going back to older ones, what about Apple 6? Have y'all used that? Yeah, it's a long time. Apple 5? Apple 4? It was the very first one. So, oh, yeah, so, so some long timers in here. That's awesome. Uh, so first, another show of hands. How many of y'all have delayed upgrading your OS version until the packages you were using from Apple were in the next version of Apple? A couple of y'all. So y'all familiar with that problem, right? So that kind of sets the stage for what we're going to be talking about today. My name is Carl George. I'm a principal software engineer at Red Hat. And this talk is the road to Apple 9. Got a bunch of contact info. It'll be on the last slide too if you're trying to grab it. We can go ahead and go. So, because of the show of hands, I figure a lot of you already know what Apple is. But just in case anyone's coming in new or needs a refresher, Apple's an acronym. It stands for Extra Packages for Enterprise Linux. It's an initiative inside the Fedora project to provide additional packages for CentOS and RHEL, or Red Hat Enterprise Linux. I've been using that acronym a lot at the booth, and sometimes I forget people say, What, what did you say, RHEL? And, uh, it's so common in my day to day that nobody thinks about it and you know, you throw it around acronyms, it's good to define them at least the first time you use them. So the goal with it is to enhance those, dis those enterprise distributions but not replace or disturb any of the stock packages. So where do Apple packages come from? We've got a diagram up here. It's not actually drawn to scale. There's a lot more than like 100 packages in Fedora, but just for kind of the uh, you know, size relationship, Lots of software in Fedora, and then a subset of that software is what Red Hat takes to turn into CentOS and RHEL, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Everything else in Fedora that isn't part, that doesn't go into those distributions, is eligible to become part of the Apple repository. Uh, Fedora maintainers still maintain their packages there. I mentioned that it's part of Fedora, but they're built to be compatible with Red Hat Enterprise Linux and CentOS and other dis compatible distributions like that. I mentioned how Red Hat takes Fedora packages and makes CentOS and RHEL out of those. Uh, the way that happens has changed in recent years. You've probably heard a little bit about it, and it was executed poorly, I think, and communicated even worse. But to put a better spin on it, uh, basically what happened was that in the past, CentOS was based on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and now RHEL is based on CentOS. We flipped the relationship around. In the, in the past, when it was downstream from RHEL, it was what we called a clone or a rebuild distribution, where we try to make it identi as identical to RHEL as possible. And that's useful for people to use, but it's very much an as-is type thing. I don't want to say product because it's not, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is the product, but it's very much as-is. There's not much you can do with it. It works or it doesn't. If you file a bug with it, a lot of times the maintainers, we'd have to just look at that, reproduce it in RHEL, and then if it worked the same way, the same error message or whatever, same behavior, we'd close the bug and say, this isn't a bug because we're bug for bug compatible. <laughs> That's not a great experience for users and it's even more frustrating for the maintainers, I think. But, let's see. The other big part with that is when you're identical, you can't accept any contributions into the distribution. It's just what it is. So the way we've changed that now because CentOS is upstream from RHEL, just barely, we can now merge in changes from the community there, from partners and customers. Anyone that's using it that wants to get a change into CentOS or into RHEL, we, we, we can do those changes in CentOS now, and then they show up in the next RHEL minor version. This has a whole lot of benefits for the whole ecosystem, for CentOS and for, for RHEL. Uh, but it did have a couple of side effects on Apple packages. So for Apple, it's always historically been built against RHEL, and then it just also happened to work on CentOS or any of the other rebuilds that existed. There were, there were others before, before CentOS and around the same time, and there are more now. But whenever you're targeting one specific minor version, which Apple always built against the current RHEL minor version, uh, if you have, if you're running what's effectively the next minor version, which is how basically what Cento, how CentOS works now, CentOS Stream 8 here, the we're right about here in the graph where RHEL 8.8 .8 is getting its final touches to come out and be released. 8.7 is still the current, but if you're using CentOS Stream 8, you've already got 8.8 .8 changes. Same thing with 9. 
Uh, if you're using it 9 right now, you've got RHEL 9.2 changes, even though that comes out in like another month or two. Sometimes those minor versions uh, introduce library changes. Not a lot. The whole idea with RHEL is to be stable for the whole life cycle uh, for the major version. But there are some libraries that have stronger compatibility guarantees than others. Like glibc, OpenSSL, you're not going to see those change the libraries almost at all. They're going to get all security back fixes, maybe some new features. But they're going to pretty much, they're, they're the, uh, we have a thing called application compatibility guide with, that defines which packages have how strong a guarantees for compatibility. Uh, other libraries move a little bit faster, and those are allowed to change versions in between the minor versions. Uh, you might have seen that before where you're trying to upgrade RHEL or one of the RHEL compatible distributions, and the p software you're using doesn't install on the new updates yet, and you have to wait and delay your update until they rebuild to be compatible. That's for one of those library changes. In the past, that was always just, okay, well, we'll you know wait a couple weeks, and then CentOS will catch up, and then your p install will work again. Uh, but now with CentOS moving up a little bit further in the stack, now we would start to see that more often. Apple packages that would install on RHEL wouldn't install on CentOS. And then if we rebuilt them to work on CentOS, then they wouldn't install on RHEL because of the slight library change. We started looking at that and thinking, how can we make that work better? And just building against one target doesn't really do it. So we came up with this new idea, Apple Next. Still, still part of Apple, basically, but it was a, kind of a, an additional repo where instead of packages being built against RHEL, they could be built against CentOS optionally. That, that allowed maintainers to get ready and stage their updates for when things, things weren't working. Uh, we, I proposed that on the mailing list back in uh, September 2020. Uh, you don't need to read that. It's very small. But I proposed that. The, steering com the Apple steering committee looked it over, and we decided to go ahead and go, go for it. So now we've, for 8, we've got Apple 8 and Apple 8 Next are the two repositories. If you're using RHEL, you would just use Apple. If you're using CentOS Stream 8, you'd use Apple 8 and Apple 8 Next. Uh, it's not an entire duplicate Apple. It's not a, a, complete, uh, a complete entire replacement. It's meant to use with it. This worked pretty well. Uh, it mostly solved the problem. We, had, we were able to resolve those packages that wouldn't install which, again, those are a small subset of the Apple packages that would be affected by that because, because of how little RHEL changes between the minor versions as far as libraries. It was only a few packages at the time we'd need to do this, but we felt it was important to give maintainers an option where they could go to do those builds. So I mentioned at the start about delaying your OS upgrade until the packages you need are in Apple. This, was, this is not just a community thing people noticed. A lot of uh, community members and customers were noticing this and telling Red Hat pretty consistently that, hey, I'm on RHEL 7. You're telling me I need to upgrade to RHEL 8 to get this feature, this fix. But the packages I use, I know you don't support them from Apple, but I need those to exist in Apple 8, and they're in Apple 7 now. The uh, Apple's gotten resources from Fedora kind of unofficially as part of the Fedora project in a, in a re release engineering resources and things like that, but kind of in an indirect way. Uh, people that were paid to work on Fedora also had to figure out ways to work on Apple when they had time, and it just wasn't prioritized. Because of all the customer and community feedback around Apple not being ready in time, um, we decided to do something about it. So. In uh, September 2021, uh, we made this announcement. Uh, at the time, I was working on the CentOS Stream team, and they, some, some of my leadership approached me and asked, how would you like to have an, an, a team dedicated to working on Apple? Because it's lagging behind. It doesn't have enough packages. We, you know, obviously, anything we want to support directly, we'll put in RHEL itself. But we still need Apple to have some more attention, more prioritization uh, to make it better and have more content there. So. I, I was like, yes, of course, that's, I love Apple. That's what, what I, how I got into the Fedora project that kind of eventually led to my job with Red Hat working on CentOS Stream. So I was more than happy to jump on board with that and start working, working on that with Focus. That was right around the time we started doing uh, Apple, Apple Next, too. We, we announced it before that. Uh, we implemented it after this change was made. The first thing, after the Apple Next, we had that working. The next thing we knew, okay, we want to plan ahead uh, RHEL 9 and CentOS 9 haven't come out yet, but what, how can we build Apple 9 earlier? How do we open it up so that way package maintainers in Fedora can get their packages into Apple 9 well before the RHEL 9 release? 
So we started thinking how we could do that. And our original plan was a little bit different than what we, for, what we eventually went with, but the idea was that we would uh, launch Apple 9 Next first, remember the one built against CentOS Stream 9, uh, because CentOS Stream 9 came out about six months before RHEL 9, so we could do that. That enabled this change. The idea was, was that we'd start Apple 9 Next and have it be a standalone repo for six months, and then and it would be built against CentOS 9, and after, uh, after the RHEL 9 launch, we were going to do a mass rebuild of the Apple 9 packages, or the Apple 9 Next packages, and then use those to populate Apple 9. Uh, and then we would launch Apple 9, you know, a few days or a few weeks after the RHEL 9 launch. That's a mouthful, a little bit harder to explain, and uh, that's why I put the little, little crazy guy, uh, I forget the name in the, in the show, but that's why I put that up there. It was hard to explain, and as we started trying to uh, document that um, and explain that to other people inside, inside Red Hat and community members, uh, we were just... We, it, the way we were going to approach it made a lot of sense from the infrastructure implementation, but it was way more confusing for maintainers and users and documenting it especially. So, uh, yeah, like I said, it was confusing for the packagers, users, and the documentation was bad. And also we'd have the complexity of doing a mass rebuild. Um, that's something we've, we Fedora Release Engineering does all the time, every Fedora release, uh, but it would be the first time we did anything like that for Apple. So... And the other big thing, what finally, finally kind of the straw that broke the camel's back was we had, we had several people telling us, like, this is all cool and it's great that it'll be in better shape, but Epl 9's still not going to be ready when RHEL 9 launches. And I really, really want that. It was what, what feedback we were getting pretty consistently. So we went back to the drawing board slightly. Um, we reevaluated it and thought, instead of telling people that, okay, you use Epl 9 next this way for six months and then you use it this other way and you primarily target Epl 9 then and all of that mess, we threw that out and said, let's just start the Epl 9 repo, build it against CentOS 9 first, and then whenever RHEL 9 comes out, we just switch the build route because, you know, put our money where our mouth is. If we're telling people this is what's going to be in RHEL in six months, let's prove it. Let's build stuff against it and then see if it works. And if it doesn't, then, you know, we'll fix it, but let's try this out and see how, if we have any problems, but we don't think we will. So that's what we did. Um, we, did, we set up Apple 9 Next at the same time, but for a little while in parallel, we had Apple 9 and Apple 9 Next built, both built against CentOS, and we just ignored Apple 9 Next until RHEL 9 came out. Then Apple 9 switched to build against uh, RHEL 9, and Apple 9 Next kept building against CentOS Stream 9 for when the libraries would diverge a little bit. At that point, after the RHEL 9 release, then the Apple 9 Next setup matched the way Apple 8 Next worked. Because of that, it made it a lot easier to explain to package maintainers and to users. Um, since the pattern, the, they already saw how we were doing things in Apple 8 Next, we didn't have to explain to them a different way. We just told them, hey, don't worry about it, just start building your stuff in Apple 9 and we'll handle the transition, we'll cut things over and it should be seamless for you. It was simpler for users to understand also because we didn't have to tell them, okay, install Apple 9 Next when you're, if you're using CentOS before RHEL comes out and then afterwards, add this other, add both repos. Also, we didn't have to, we got rid of all of that. It made it a lot easier to document and explain to users and package maintainers. And then probably the biggest thing I'm you know, burying the lead here, it made it where Epl 9 was actually available before Rel 9, or from the business's point of view, uh, Rel 9 when Rel 9 launched, Epl 9 was there and had content, had packages, maintainers had had about five and a half, six months to get all their software into Epl that they wanted to maintain there and then it was just ready to go at the, ni at the RHEL 9.0 release. Oh, the other big benefit, I almost forgot, that got rid of doing any kind of a mass rebuild either. We decided that the CentOS Stream 9 content and the RHEL 9.0 content, they're close enough that doing a mass rebuild to rebuild every package was basically unnecessary. Um, we, were, we wondered if there might have been some kind of exception, if something else got, like, got a version changed late right before the RHEL release and nothing did, it went very smoothly and we, d we didn't get any bug reports about an Apple 9 package that was built against CentOS 9 that didn't install on RHEL 9 day one. Every as far as we know, everything worked. So I got ahead of myself a little bit. Um, when we came up with that plan, the Apple we went, took it to the Apple Steering Committee. They approved it. And 
Um, we did all the infrastructure work. Uh, yeah, and the notable thing was that this was the first time that Apple was able actually to say, we're open, we're ready for business for maintainers to start doing their work before RHEL launched. Uh, and that was only possible because of the changes to CentOS. And pretty much immediately, we had tons of questions. People said, hey, how, how can Apple 9 launch? RHEL 9 isn't out yet. And then we'd explain the differences and how we were, all the stuff I just described to y'all about how we're doing it differently now. And they're like, okay, well, uh, how can you call this ready? Like, you did this announcement, and, you know, this pa XYZ package that I want isn't in there yet. I'm like, well, there's, there's no specific content set that we say this is what Apple is. It's a community repo. You know, build it and they will come. We, our, our goal was to open it up and then let all of the Fedora maintainers, who are also the Apple maintainers, get their work in there. So if there's a package that you were looking for that isn't in Apple 9, the answer is you need to go ask for it. A lot, of the, a lot of these Fedora maintainers that are the Apple maintainers, they will, if they're not using that release yet themselves, they'll, they'll only add their packages to Apple when somebody asks for it. Uh, we did a little bit more work there to standardize. In the documentation, we did this whole kind of workflow for how to, how to request Apple packages when they weren't available. Another big, another aspect I would point out for that is that uh, we were trying to get people in the mentality of communicating. Uh, a big as, uh, aspect of the CentOS changes is that we were taking it from a community of users to a community of potential contributors, not just using it as is, but getting involved, filing bugs, even submitting contributions to fix things. And so that same theme of communicating with the maintainer, not just using it blindly and accepting it how it is, uh, we wanted to encourage that same thing for Apple. If there's a package you need in Apple, don't just wait for someone to get around to adding it. Go file a bug, talk to them, or find them in IRC, different communications channels we have, and say, hey, I'd really like to use your package. You, you've got it in Apple 7 and Apple 8, but hey, how about Apple 9 now? We wanted to really encourage that. The Fedora build tools uh, make it pretty easy to automate builds these days. Mm -hmm. uh, why not just auto attempt to build L uh, EL, uh, Apple Eight packages on Apple Nine. So it's always so. Repeating the question. Wait, I don't need to repeat. You just sit in the mic. Perfect. So we've talked about that. A lot of people say, like, you know, why doesn't every every package get carried forward all the time? And uh, the main reason is is that sometimes sometimes those packages get into the next rail release themselves. So we want to check there to make sure that it's not conflicting. Um, and then also the libraries change. A lot of times the maintainer may need to make a specific decision around. I can add this version of the software because of the libraries that it supports, or this version of the software is going to have more, more maintenance updates from upstream, so I want to pick that one, not the, absolute, not the one that was in Apple 8 or the one that's in Fedora right now. Um, sometimes it may not be possible to build like the latest Fedora package in the current, raw, uh, current Apple 9. Uh, so it's just there's a lot more moving pieces, and for now at least we've made that, making, we're making that a, an opt-in thing and the maintainers to make, have full control over what goes in when. That's a good question, though. But save the rest for the end. <laughs> so, fast forward about six months. We had Apple 9 out, and then RHEL 9 launched. And the early Apple launch allowed RHEL to have a lot of pa community-maintained packages available on day one. That was something that we got to, got to highlight a little bit at the at Red Hat Summit when they announced uh, RHEL 9. And uh, actually, you have some of the counts here. We had about 5,700 packages. Um, and if you're familiar with how things are built, one source package can make mul more than one uh, package that you actually install. So the, those 5,700 packages were built from about 2,600 packages. Um, so that was, that was great news. We had, uh, it made a lot of our community members happy. It lo made a lot of our customers happy. Uh, instead of saying, well, we know we're not going to even look. Rail 9.0 just came out. We're not even going to look at it for, you know, a year or two. That actually changed a few minds where they could say, yeah, like, we can we see this. It's already been we've already been looking at it with CentOS Stream 9 early. We even filed some bugs or contributed and fixed a few bu fixed a few things in it. And now we've got these Apple packages and you know eight out of the ten ones that I'm looking for are there. And I'll I'll file bugs for the rest of them, uh, getting them involved in everything. So how is Apple 9 doing now? So this chart may be a little hard to see. But basically, the main thing to notice is the growth trends. Uh, we've got my laser pointer. 
So right here is the RHEL 7 launch in uh, mid-2014, and the Apple, set, Apple 7 repo started about the same time, and you can see the kind of the growth trajectory for it. And then we've got RHEL 8 and Apple 8. There was a little bit of a delay there before launching Apple 8. And then here, in the last one, we've got Apple 9 first, and then RHEL 9 launch. And that dotted line, that's showing about that 2600 mark of uh, source packages. What we had at the RHEL 9 launch, it took Apple 8 to get, it took Apple 8 about a year to get there, and it took Apple 7 about a year and a half to get to that number. So it's really enabled us to have a lot faster growth and get more packages available for, for users and customers. Bonus talk. Y'all didn't know y'all were getting two talks in one today. So, the road to Apple 10. So, while the Apple Next model that we started with 8 and did with 9 also, uh, that solved real problems. And, but the, we've also noticed that uh, while what we went with was a little bit easier to understand, it still confuses some people. It takes a little bit of explaining to get across about the different targets and things like that. Um, and also it means that because it's optional for maintainers to do that, uh, some maintainers just say, okay, whatever, I'll leave my package broken for six months and then I'll rebuild it when the change hits rail and then I'll fix it there for everywhere. Um, that, meant, that meant a subpar experience for CentOS users. And we really don't want that. Um, we don't want people to look at CentOS as just, oh, this is this uh, development release and you shouldn't really use it anywhere. No, it's still a good operating system that you can use pretty much anywhere you want to and we wanted Apple to complement that or we do want Apple to complement that. So um, another problem with, that we had with it, I mentioned the library changes that would come into, you'd see them in CentOS, you could rebuild your package in Apple Next, get it compatible, and you temporarily have two packages, the RHEL targeted one and the CentOS targeted one. But once that same change that happened in CentOS lands in RHEL, there was no way for us to take that build and reuse it. The maintainer had to go rebuild it again once the same changes were in RHEL. So it was double rebuild work when you had library changes. Um, and there's also kind of a decision flow for maintainers. Whenever, whenever they're introducing, introducing a package, they'd build it in Apple, then they'd find out, oh, it's, this Apple package doesn't install on CentOS. Also, I need to go do an Apple Next build now. Or maybe I only can do an Apple Next build now because the change I need isn't in rail yet at all, a new package or something like that, a dependency. So you had some cases where the maintainer would do an Apple, not, Apple 9 Next build and then wait six months and then do an Apple 9 build. So not the greatest uh, workflow, and so we started thinking, what, what can we do to make this a little bit more obvious and a little bit more intuitive for maintainers? So just like I proposed the uh, Apple Next plan, I, I just came up with the Apple 10 proposal. Uh, this time, instead of the mailing list, I decided we've got a section in the Fedora discussion, uh, which is a disc discourse platform, uh, basically forums. I started in there just because I wanted it. I wanted it to be a little easier to go back and edit the uh, edit the post when I found my typos and uh, other FAQ things that people consistently were asking. I wanted to be able to go back and edit it, and so email was out. <laughs> also, I did send an email and said, "Hey, please come talk about this with me on the Fedora discussion platform." Um, and we'll get in. Don't have to try and read that text. Obviously, way too small. But uh, the basic summary. I'll get into it in the next few slides. Is that we're going to have an Apple repo for every minor version of Tim but we're gonna do, try and manage it in a way that uh, works more intuitively. Um, a quick, one quick note before I get into the details of it. Uh, came up with a proposal and it is, we, we already took it to the Apple steering committee and we voted on it and uh, while we didn't wanna commit to exact details of some of the implementation details, the overall direction of having a minor version per, per release, or a uh, minor version repos rather, uh, we agreed on that and approved it. So this is happening. Exactly how we do it might vary slightly from what I'm about to show you, but this is the general direction we're going in. So this is a little bit of a refresher, backtracking to what I talked about with the Apple 9 launch. We started Apple 9, uh, built against CentOS 9, and we used the .el9, what's called the disk tag. That becomes part of the, the version of the package, what the, the part of it we call the release. And then that would populate the, the Apple slash nine uh, path on the mirrors. After the RHEL 9 release came out, we switched things up. The Apple 9 branch would build against RHEL 9, 
and it would always get the latest rel 9 content at first it's 90 and then when 91 comes out that would just pop that would just fill in that build root and maintainers would start building against that right away uh, and that would still get the el9 disk tag apple 9 next uh, kept building against centos 9 and we changed it slightly. This is the same thing we did with Apple 8 Next. We, we appended .next on the end of the disk tag, so you knew clearly this was a package that was built uh, for this repo for CentOS. And we used a different repo path for that. Um, like I said, that's the way that structure works, but that's way different. Oh, sorry, one more slide on this. Um, and then uh, people, people might ask, what happens whenever uh, CentOS Stream 9 reaches its end of life date in, that's, 2027, we'll retire the Apple 9 next branch. Apple 9 will keep going because RHEL 9 is still maintained through 2032, I believe. And so Apple 9 will keep going, but the Apple 9 next branch will get retired and we'll move the Apple 9 next repo to the archive. So the way that works is completely different than how Fedora maintainers are used to doing their work. And if anyone has a question on one of these specific slides, we can definitely go back to them in the Q&A. So I'm going I'm to get through these though. Uh, so the Fedora branches, we've got our Rawhide branch at the front. That's built against Fedora Rawhide, the rolling release. But it gets the disk tag number for what the next Fedora release is going to be, which at the time I wrote this, it was Fedora 38. It's actually 39 now. 38's in the final stages of getting released. Uh, and that would go into this repo path. Uh, Fedora 37, at the time, this was the current, current release. Actually, it still is. Built against Fedora 37, and corresponding disk tag and repo path. Same thing with 36, uh, and then 35, that was retired a month after 37 came out, and this, similar to what I showed before, it moves, once it's, the branch is retired, and then it moves over to the archive repo path. And then here's closer to where we're at now. Uh, Fedora 38 is about to be released. It's very close. I think they just uh, approved the beta, and then uh, that'll, 38 and 37 will be the current releases. Uh, when that happens, Fedora 36, it's not retired yet, but it will be soon. Uh, and then Rawhide's moved on to the next disk tag, which will be 39 whenever it branches off. So I was looking at that, and that's where I, I started thinking, what if we made Apple minor version repos that mirrored what we do in Fedora repos for the major versions there? So this is what I'm thinking about with it. We can have an Apple 10 branch at the very start. We'll build it, build it against CentOS Stream 10, and then uh, we'll use a disk tag for what the release it's going to be compatible with. When CentOS 10 first comes out, it's basically going to have content that's going to look like what RHEL 10.0 looks like. So let's just go ahead and add that, that format 10 underscore zero corresponds to the 10.0. And we'll use that format for the disk tag and just declare that up front. And we'll put that in the repo path as well. We'll make that the 10.0 repo. And then this is where things get real interesting. RHEL 10 comes out. 10.0, the 10.0 repo, or we'll create an Apple 10.0 branch from the Apple 10 branch, kind of like how Fedora 38 branch from Fedora Rawhide branch. We'll create that branch with the minor version. It'll build against RHEL 10.0. It'll use the 10.0 10 disk tag and the 10.0, it'll keep going to the 10.0 repo path that we were populating before with packages built against CentOS. But we'll have the Apple 10 branch, that'll bump up to 10 underscore 1 and a 10 dot, start creating the 10.1 repo path, getting one release ahead, kind of like Fedora Rawhide does. Moving forward, then we'll have a similar thing. Whenever, whenever RHEL 10.1 comes out, we'll retire the 10.0 branch. Um, there actually is a Red Hat product to stay on 10.0 longer after 10.1 comes out, but for now, we're not including that in this at all. Um, there's been some conversations whether we should, but at least for the initial implementation, uh, we're going to leave that out. If we wanted to change that later, all we would have to do is not retire the branch right away. So we'll have Apple 10.1 built against RHEL 10.1, and then the Apple 10 branch will get bumped up to say that it claimed that it's 10.2 and populate the 10.2 repo path. And of course, the 10.0 repo, that'll move over to the archive repository. Same thing with uh, when RHEL 10.2 comes out, we'll, all the number, numbers, numbers will just bump across the board. Uh, Apple 10 branch will start building, will start having a 10.3 disk tag and a 10.3 repo path. 10.2 will be for RHEL 10.2 exactly across the board, and then we'll archive the 10.0 repo and retire the 10, or sorry, the 10.1 repo and uh, archive the 10.1 branch. 
So it's a lot of numbers, but uh, I think that this, this uh, model, it matches how, what Fedora maintainers are used to doing in Fedora for their packages, and they'll just have the subset of minor versions for each major version. Um, and then, you know, fast forward in time, they'll be managing the same thing with Apple 11 and Apple 10. Um, the real big benefit there is that, a side benefit is that even though we're not going to explicitly support the RHEL EUS releases where you stay on a release longer, um, because of the way we're doing this, we'll still have that repo in the archive and if you're, if you're stuck on, say, uh, 10.0 EUS, you can switch to the archive repository and still get packages compatible with 10.0. Even if they're not maintained anymore, you'll still have stuff that's still working. That's a problem we see sometimes where uh, somebody will add Apple to, a rep, to, to an older release, whether that's with RHEL EUS, with the actual product that does that with security fixes, or if they're just using one of like the free rail rebuilds that they just pin the release and don't do any updates, which is you definitely shouldn't do that. That means you're not getting any security updates at all. None of the rebuilds uh, support staying a minor version behind. You have to stay current there. What's that? Yeah, we're basically there, but yeah, the. Uh, they can go and look at the archive repo and get something that's definitely going to still work and be compatible with 10.0 because that's what it was built against the entire time. Um, we're still working out all the implementation details of how to do this, uh, when we're going to start doing it like in the staging, staging infrastructure and making sure it all works correctly, but uh, everyone's more or less on board with it. There's a little bit of bike shedding about how we want to do like the disk tag format and uh, how we want to do the release packages, things like that, but this is the direction we're going in. But uh, yeah, that is... Uh, I'll go back to any of those slides we need for a question, but yeah, that is the uh, the end of the bonus talk, and I guess the main talk also, um, and so we can uh, open up the Q and A. The quick question I have: I have a couple, but I'll sure. start with one of them. Uh, what mechanism have you guys thought about for patching in place the the repo that you know when we do the next update on the server, uh, it'll pick up the next version? So what we're looking at there is the um, on the mirror, in the mirror infrastructure, we're thinking, I'm, I'm assuming this is about the Apple 10 part, right? About yeah. moving from the next, yes, to the next yeah. moment? Okay. Um, basically, we're, we're thinking we're gonna have sim links on the, in the infrastructure. We, we wanna do a 10 sim link that'll point to the current rail minor version and then have like a CentOS 10 sim link that points to the absolute latest minor version. So the re we'd have two release packages. If you're using CentOS, you'd use this, like Apple CentOS release, something like that. We don't know, again, bike shedding over naming stuff, it's hard. Uh, but then we'll have a separate one for RHEL. The RHEL one will use the 10 sim link. The CentOS one will use the CentOS 10 sim link. Uh, some people want to call it 10 stream. I actually don't like the name stream. I, I might have confused some people. I was interchangeably saying CentOS and CentOS stream. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have thoughts on that. Ask me over drinks or around the conference floor. I could go on and on much longer than the time I have here to, <laughs> to rant about that. But. The idea is that we'd have uh, those separate sim links. The, uh, the CentOS 10 one would keep following the new minor versions as, as they come out, and then the, the 10 one would stick with the current RHEL minor version. Um, that has a neat side effect that in DNF, uh, in the package manager, if you, you can pass it a flag dash dash release ver, and you can override what version it is. That defaults to the major version, uh, so that'll point you to 10, but if you override that to say 10.0 after 10 one comes out, that will point you to the right place in the mirrors. And even though the sim link has 10 pointing to 10.1, if you explicitly pass it 10.0, you'll just still get the 10.0 repo from the archive. That, that actually answers one of my second, my Perfect. second, I think. Um, I haven't been following the, the shift, <laughs> um, but uh, so what does Red Hat or IBM recommend now if we want to use like CentOS for lower environments, for example? So do we use this? Uh, Version, t uh, version tagging um, that you recommend to be basically always one behind. Is what, if we want to use CentOS, we should always be one behind RHEL, right? Is that the idea? So it used to be. I'll go back to the slide for that. It wasn't really one behind, but it was behind. It was a downstream rebuild. That's all the way at the start. I'm guessing there's probably third parties that still provide a clone, but if, if, we, wanted sure, to use, yeah. if we wanted to use CentOS, what's the approach yeah, recommended? So the, uh, so the old model, right, CentOS was downstream of RHEL. It wasn't, it wasn't a version behind, but like RHEL, say, 7.4 would come out, and it would take about a month for CentOS 7.4 to come out corresponding to it. Um, 
And I mentioned, uh, I don't know if you came in later, saw the beginning, but I talked about how uh, as a downstream, it's as is, you can't change anything, you can't fix bugs, you can't accept contributions. It's just frustrating to use and fr even more frustrating to maintain. Um, I mean, if it does everything you want, no bugs, everything's happy, it's great. And, it's, and people are happy with that. That's how CentOS got to be so popular in the first place. But anyone that's tried to get involved with the project or try to contribute, getting turned away is just a bad experience. So moving now, now instead of being you know a month lagging behind, now we're about four to six months ahead of RHEL. The changes that are going to go into like say RHEL 9.2 that isn't out yet, those are already in CentOS 9, and you can use those now. So um, we the lag before it wasn't staying a minor version behind; it was just about a month delay to catch up to RHEL, and then it tried to stay the same as RHEL. I get that. I'm not sure I got the answer that I was hoping sure, for. Sure, yeah, um, yeah. The original uh, question was about uh, what to use now. So personally, I think that CentOS is great and everyone should be using it. Uh, obviously, I'm biased, but uh, it's still 90 to 95 percent the same software versions as what's in RHEL. It doesn't ch RHEL doesn't change that much between minor versions. So by nature, because CentOS is reflecting that next minor version before it comes out in RHEL, it's still not that different. Most things you're going to do work the same. Guides, that, you know, installation guides or, or tutorials, most of those still work the same. And it's, it's just not different enough to matter to me. Um, one big, the bigger difference for people that like to stay way behind on their uh, updates is that uh, in the old model, CentOS matched the 10-year life cycle of RHEL. In this new model, we're following along RHEL when it's still having minor versions, which is five years. Uh, and it comes out about six months early, so say five and a half years. Um, so if you were the type of person using, say, CentOS 7 into, like, year 9 of its life cycle, um, you probably, you might not be that happy with CentOS stream moving a little bit faster. Um, not that it moves very much faster. It's actually on the same pace. Rails on a three-year major version cadence now and a six-month minor version cadence. And so CentOS matches that. It has a new major version every three years. It just technically doesn't have minor versions anymore. Those updates that are coming in the next minor version just get released once they pass QA and are deemed ready. So I think it's still usable and it's great and it gets people, gets people fixes faster. If you contribute something, you'll see that contribution reflected faster and can start consuming it uh, rather than having to wait a whole another six months or a year to see it show up in RHEL, uh, depending on what version they target it at. So I still think it's really useful, but if, that, if that's not working for whatever reason, some specific software that has compatibility that isn't working right yet, uh, I would encourage pushing on that software vendor or hardware vendor to look at targeting CentOS so that way they can be ready for the next minor version. Uh, we've seen that before with a good example is the OpenZFS project. They had a, they noticed a, a breaking change in a minor version of RHEL and it was in I think 8.2 or 8.1, something in the kernel changed and it made their, uh, their packages stop installing, stop building. Uh, I got caught wind of it and talked to them and said, you know, I'm not trying to be mean about this, but you know, this change has been public for about six or seven months now. Um, and so if you want to know about these kind of things, these changes in the kernel beforehand, uh, you should really look at at least running your CI against CentOS Stream so that way you'll get an early warning and then you'll have your packages ready to go when the corresponding RHEL minor version comes out. And they thought that was fantastic. They're like, yeah, we need to do that. So now OpenZFS is running their CI against, uh, I don't remember which rebuild, they're doing a rebuild also to make sure it still works with the current uh, RHEL minor release but they're also doing it against CentOS to make sure they're, they're staying ahead of the game and can stay compatible and not just have to tell people, oh, don't update your server yet because our packages aren't ready yet. So there's still several rebuilds that are uh, this empty spot on the slide. I used to have a picture of uh, the Alma logo there, but uh, I was advised it's not good to try and like endorse any particular one. So there's lots of rebuild options. Um, there were multiple before in the cent early, earlier CentOS days. There's even more now. Uh, so if there's, if for whatever reason the CentOS model if in a particular workload is not working right, there's still rebuilds, there's lots of choices. Thank you. Of course. Anybody else? You know, I've been told, I'm, I've been told I'm a little, he said that uh, I was nicer about it than he would have been. And uh, I've been told I'm a little bit too crass, but I, I try to tone it down. <laughs> I was really hoping not to use a rebuild, a third-party rebuild, but it sounds like I have to. You don't have to. <laughs> well, no, I don't. But the problem is, I don't want a bug fix in CentOS Stream that I'm going to that fixes something that I is going to break when I move to production, the where I'm using RHEL. Are you calling? Yeah, uh, you get you get to control when things 
Well, I mean, if there's releases thing. every, if there's a release every day, there, it inevitably will happen where Stream will get a fix that is not going to be ready for production. Uh, define ready for production. If there's going to be a library change or a bug fix in Stream, that when I push that day to production is going to be behaving differently, and it will take forever to figure out why is this working differently in production than when so we tested it. So two things: one, you. you you can choose what ro updates you roll out and when. Two, like. Uh, That's what I'm saying. I want to pin it to the production version. You know. Uh, what does production mean? Production is the set of packages that run in RHEL. I speak a little more. Yeah. So, the packages packages aren't just getting thrown over the wall into CentOS and say, "Hey, tell us if this is ready." No, that stuff it goes through all of the RHEL QA and processes, and then it gets approved to go into CentOS. So it's not just, I mean, yes, it's always possible for there to be regressions. Regressions happen in real minor versions and hit customers all the time. But now, when that regression happens, when a regression happens in RHEL, if it's not severe enough, you got to wait six months or a year to get it fixed in the next minor version, which really sucks. When it happens, if, a, if a, and when a regress, re, uh, regression happens in CentOS, now you can get a turnaround time of maybe a couple of weeks to get that update fit, built. Yeah, even days. Like, we're, we're getting faster at it. Early, early days, months maybe, now we're down to probably weeks, I would say, on average. And yes, there's no reason we can't get that turnaround time for a regression down to a couple of days. So. I'm not. <laughs> no worries. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little confused about this last part. Um, to me, it sounds like, I mean, I'm with you that CentOS, CentOS will have the best there is because it already went through yep. regression testing, QA, whatever. Exactly. But if I release to prod that day, prod does not have that package yet. So the behavior will be different in prod. Are you talking about running rail in production, but then like CentOS stream and staging? Yeah, exactly. Environment, lower environments. Uh, that's what I'm talking. Okay. That was how I prefaced my question. I, I want to run non-rail. What's that? <laughs> oh no. So I, I, I want to have a portable, supportable <laughs> solu solution. Couple, for prod. couple of things for that. And my job is not to sell rail. I do work for Red Hat. I think I mentioned that earlier. That, uh, but my job is not to sell rail. But one neat thing that we don't talk about enough is that. If you're paying for RHEL in production, you can get free RHEL in staging. How do I do that in a cloud provider? If I'm using a cloud provider, they don't know if it's prod or non-prod. I actually don't know the answer to that question. Like I said, I don't actually sell this stuff, but I know <laughs> that it's a program called the Developer Subscription for Teams. For on-prem, I know about that. Okay. It works great. Perfect. But for yeah. a cloud pro solution, there, I don't know if there's a way to distinguish between prod and non-prod. In the cloud, it all looks kind of... I don't I know guess. if you have like a sales rep or like an account manager yeah, with the I, I could ask cloud. Them. That's what I would talk to them and see if there's a way to use it's the dev sub for teams to use that in a cloud provider. I think you should be able to because it's just a subscription and an entitlement. Um, and then you could run. Uh, I still would advise running some CentOS stream so you get the, that early warning oh, like, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah. this thing changed and it's not necessarily, it's not something that broke, but it's this new thing that behaves differently or this new capability, something new, cool that we can do. You can start using that and be prepared for it, uh, but then still also have like, I don't know, just a different phase, you could have CentOS in development and then RHEL dev sub for teams for free in staging and then RHEL in production. But isn't there a 16 server limit on that license? So there are there are two two similarly named programs. That is the developer subscription the for individuals. One. That is, you get 16 free instances of RHEL and then the develop, that one you can use it for production but it's specifically individual only. Like there's a clause in there like you can't agree to it on behalf of a business. It's targeted in individuals. D does your cloud provider let you BYO OS? Um, yeah, but so, it, so this could. Uh, I'd rather use yeah. IBM or Red Hat. Well, I mean, if they provided. if they have real images, you just kick kick the yeah, server and then you use. register with the different subscriptions. Exactly. Just yeah. The developer subscription for Teams, that one, it's different. They're, I don't like that they're similarly named. That one. I don't remember the exact number. It's way more than 16. It's in the thousands. It's really high. Uh, yeah. I actually don't know if it's a public number now that I think about it. But that one's explicitly for non-production use. Yeah. But um, there, there's a high limit. But what I usually tell people is to just look at it like a like a BOGO. Buy one, get one free. If you're paying for one rail server in production, consider that you get at least one free rail server in development. It's not one-to-one, -one, but just treat it like that. It's so if, I ha if my company has an unlimited rail subscription, do I get unlimited... Is that a thing? Test? I, th I think we have a, I asked. Maybe they, they said, do. They I said it's unlimited, and I looked, and it, and it had no. Not a salesman. It not, had no maybe limit. Maybe somebody sold you that. <laughs> unlimited, just you run it everywhere. Why not? 
you know? Is it like the like the rail for data center thing? Is that what you're talking about? I, I can't I answer I that, but, that. I, but I went and actually looked at it, and it said unlimited, and I was like, I have not seen that before. Well, there you go. Then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Use all yeah, the rail we, everywhere. We count ours. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Any other questions or comments? Anything? I can take tough questions. It's all right. Thank you. I, awesome. I only, I, quick, I mean, I don't know if I speak, I don't want to speak for everybody, <laughs> but my feedback is, I think for me visually, it would be nice to have like a timeline that shows, um, I think it would explain it well, uh, to have this timeline for, for rel nine, I mean, for, for both the nine and the 10, I think in the very beginning, I think the first slide had that kind of timeline almost, but it wasn't quite, didn't have dates on it. I think if the dates yeah. were there, maybe it would be clear. I actually have an image that you might find useful. Let me switch to that. Um, oh, where did I put it? While you're doing that, I just want to say this for me clarified oh so much. <laughs> like I'm, so, I'm glad so much. That, that, that is the goal. Good I to hear that that's happening. All of a sudden, you know, this, this, because I was not paying attention for about a year because I was using a cloud provider's, um, you know, it, compatible, uh, binary compatible version. And so uh, now that I'm paying attention again to, to RHEL, this really caught me up to where things are right now. And I completely had a different, I was under the old paradigm, and now I understand the new paradigm. That is great to hear. Uh, one of these thumb drives, I have an image on that I'll show you that might be what you're talking about with the timeline a I little bit. I'm sure, I'm sure it's or there. better yet, uh, if you go by the expo floor, the CentOS booth, I'll be there. And uh, even if I'm not there, we've got some computers there set up and it, the images are on there. Um, I can probably get it pulled up here in just a second. But basically, it shows kind of the branching between how, uh, how CentOS comes off of, yeah, this is the right one, at a 50-50 shot. Let me drag it over. Yeah, something similar. Let me, uh, I'm gonna click go. <laughs> so here, here's the old model, right? We had uh, Fedora Rawhide, the roll and release. Fedora, my, Fedora versions come off of that. RHEL 7 was more or less based on Fedora 19. Uh, and, but this was all private internal development. Nobody could see it. And then we would just have the RHEL 7.0 release and it was kind of throw it over the wall open source. Uh, Here's the, here's the thing, and it's open, it, look how open source it is, but it wasn't really open, it was open source technically because we released the source code, but in the spirit of like collaborative community development, things like that, accepting contributions, it wasn't really, um, it was more proprietary development model, but then still technically open source after the fact. CentOS Linux 7 come along and rebuild that source code to make, make a free, op, free enterprise operating system that was more or less identical to RHEL. It, wasn't, it was never perfectly identical, but the, the goal was to be as close as possible. I'm going to skip over 8 because 8's really messy, just to show 9 real quick. So with 9, we've, we're not doing the rebuild anymore. There's other rebuilds that, are, that still exist, but CentOS Stream 9, that came off of Fedora 34. We had an early, the early bootstrap phase where we're getting all the changes finalized, and then uh, and like the RHEL 9 beta came out before that, then we did the, the CentOS Stream 9 release announcement where we kind of indicated about six months before RHEL 9 and said, yeah, now, now's a good time to start using it if you want to start deploying this. And then RHEL 9, RHEL, that was around also the time, tying it back into the talk, that was when we launched Apple 9. So we were building it early. And then RHEL 9.0 came out, 9.0 came out. Uh, and then we're right about here now. RHEL 9.2 is already branched off from CentOS Stream 9, uh, but it hasn't been released by Red Hat yet. It's, I think we're about a month or two out. We're on 9.1 is the current. Uh, but if you're using CentOS 9, you already have 9.2 changes and actually technically could start getting 9.3 changes. Uh, 8 is me way more messy because um, the, the original pitch, the guy that hired me at Red Hat, he, a he asked me, well, what if, what if CentOS and RHEL flip places? What if RHEL was based on CentOS? And I said, yeah, that actually sounds cool. We got, could all do all these things different. We could actually fix bugs to get them into RHEL. And, uh, the way he described it to me was, okay, well, for this to work right, we have to start this with nine because we have to build it into the rel maintainer workflow um, to do it correctly. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Um, he's like, do you want to come work on it? Yeah, I'd love to. 
Uh, all right, I'll, I'll let you know when I get a rig. Uh, about four or five months later, uh, they announced CentOS Stream, and I wasn't an employee yet. Uh, they announced it for eight. And I'm like, what, what, what the heck? I, you, you said this had to be in nine uh, to do it correctly. How are you bolting it onto eight? And he's like, dude, don't ask. Like, and then, then I got hired and helped to, uh, <laughs> helped to sort through all of that change. Uh, we basically had two rebuilds for eight. We had the, <clears throat> the only reason we had the CentOS Stream name is because we had to do two in one release. We had to differentiate them. I still just call it CentOS, but the technical terms are CentOS Linux was the rebuild. CentOS Stream is the new upstream model. But in 8, it was still a rebuild, just a rebuild of the internal rail branch. Uh, so we were managing two rebuilds with all of the problems that involved that, uh, that came along with that. And it's been, it's been kind of painful, honestly. Um, we're finally getting that fixed. We're, for 8, 9, we're actually making the 8 uh, lines actually look like the 9 ones. Uh, and the big significant change there is that rel maintainers take over their builds in CentOS. They're already doing it for nine. Uh, in eight, they're going to take them over, which is happening like right now, actually. Uh, there was just a post about a week or two ago on the devil mailing, CentOS devil mailing list saying that, you know, if you don't see any updates for like a week or two, don't freak out. Like, we, we're on an infrastructure freeze because we're changing a bunch of things over. Um, and basically getting all those sources migrated over into GitLab, which is where we build rel nine and CentOS nine at. Uh, and that's how we have merge requests now. Thanks to <laughs> your hat, GitLab. Does that help uh, clear things up slightly? Of course. Any other questions? I think I might be over time. Oh, you're good. Thank you.